Hi, and welcome to this talk, Getting Started with Duende Identity Server. My name is Kevin Jones from Rock Solid Knowledge. So in this talk, we'll see how to install Duende Identity Server, but using in-memory stores. And we do this initially just to keep things simple. We'll also write an API client that needs authentication, and we'll see how to set that up with Identity Server and we'll also write a web client that will use the API and so use this authentication and that itself will require authentication. So this talk is one of a series of talks. And in a later talk, we'll see how we set up Duende Identity Server to use Entity Framework for its stores and also how to use ASP.NET Identity for its user store. So the simplest way to create a new instance of Identity Server is to use the templates and we can use the templates provided by Duende. But to do that, we first need to install the templates. We can do that from the command line. So we do that by running .NET, new, minus I for install, and then the name of the templates, which in this case is duende.identityserver.templates. And this will install the templates for us. And we can see here the names of the templates. And the one we'd like to use is is in mem. So to do that, we can do .NET, new, and then the name of the template, which we said was is in mem. And that will create a project for us using that template. And if I look in this directory, we can see that project. So we get our CS proj file, we get a bunch of pages, we get a program CS, and we get our dub 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 root. And by the way, we're using .NET version six here. However, we aren't gonna do that. That would be cheating. What we are gonna do is start from scratch. So I've changed directory here. I'm now in a directory called IDS. And inside here, I'm going to run .NET new web. So web is one of the templates that comes with .NET, and this will create me a new empty web application. And then we'll take this application and add all of the identity server bits to it. So if I look in this directory, we'll see our project file called ids.csproj. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run Rider, and inside Rider, I'll create a new solution and I'll add this project to that solution. So here we are with the project loaded into Rider. This would be exactly the same if we were using Visual Studio. So we see we have a solution called Identity, one project called IDS. This is a .NET 6 project. So if we use the projects prior to .NET 6, you'll see some changes here. In particular, note we have a program CS file, but no startup CS file. So everything is now done inside program.cs. I want to make one change here before we get started. So inside properties, we have our launch settings, and I'm just gonna change the default ports here. So our HTTPS port is going to be 5443, and our HTTP port, which we aren't going to use, but we'll set it anyway, is going to be 5000. And I can run this. So if I do that now, it will fire up the browser for me. And inside here, we just see the text, hello world. And if I look at the code inside here, we see that this application initially is very simple, and it's mapping a get call to forward slash to the text hello world, which is why we're seeing that output. So how do we turn this into an instance of identity server? Well, the first thing we have to do is from inside NuGet is to add the Duende identity server package. So from my NuGet window here, I search for duende.identityserver, and I'm going to add that into the project. And then once I've installed that, I can then configure the project to use that as middleware and then have that running as a web application. So things are different in .NET 6. So here we don't have our startup CS and we don't have the method call to add services. Instead in .NET 6, we do everything through the builder. So here I can say builder.services.add and we're going to say add identity server. And add identity server takes an options object that we use to configure identity server. And on this options object, we're going to set some configuration. In particular, we're going to set some event management. 
So we're going to say raise error events is true. Raise information events is true. Raise failure events is true. And raise success events is true. So every time something happens inside Identity Server, an event will be raised and we can handle that event if we need to. We are also going to add this option, which is the emit static audience claim is true. And this will ensure that the audience claim, the AUD claim, is always in the token. So for more information on this, you can browse to this URL. Okay, so now that we've done our basic configuration, we need to configure Identity Server with things like the clients this is going to serve and the resources it's going to manage. And for this, because we're doing this as an in-memory identity server with in-memory resources and in-memory clients, we're going to add an in-memory set of resources and clients to identity server and a set of test users to identity server. So to get this going, we'll initially call, for example, add test users and add an empty list of users, just so we can see this working before we go and add some dummy users into this. So here, I'm going to say new list of test user. And then on top of this, we're going to add in-memory clients with a new list of clients. We'll add in-memory API resources with a new list of API resources. Add in-memory API scopes with a new list of API scopes. And also a set of in-memory identity resources, which again, we'll initialize to an empty list of identity resource. And with that all in place, we can then call builder.build. So I'll just move that line to here. Okay, with the configuration built, we can now add identity server into the pipeline. So to do that, I'm gonna call app.use identity server. Remember identity server is middleware and this adds identity server into that middleware pipeline. And then here we finally call app.run to run the application. And this should be enough to have set up identity server. To see this, Let's run the application again. So remember the application for the root URL puts out hello world, and we haven't changed that. So how can we prove that identity server is installed correctly? Well, we can browse to something known as the discovery document, and that's at a well-known URL. And that URL is forward slash dot well hyphen known forward slash open ID configuration. And if I hit that endpoint and all is well, we'll get the discovery document. And here we go. So this tells an endpoint or a user the information it needs to know about this instance of identity server. So for example, in here, we can see the grant types it supports, the response type supported. Notice that at the moment, there are no claims supported. And notice as well that the only scope that is supported is offline access. And we'll change all that by adding this in-memory information into identity server. So let's go and do that now. So remember the point of identity server is to give us protected access to resources. So we need to define the set of resources that we want to protect. And then we need to define the set of clients that can have access to those resources and the level of access that they have. And we'll see later, we can also use identity server to provide authentication for users. So we also need a set of users that can be authenticated. So where do we get that data from? So if I look back in the code, at the moment, we are adding an empty set of users and clients and resources. So to test this, we need to provide some data for these users and clients and resources and everything else. So I could just go ahead here and create some data that we can plug into this, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to cheat slightly. If we were to use the template to create an instance of identity server, that template comes with a set of predefined dummy users, clients, etc. And I'm going to use that. At the end of this video, you'll see a URL for this project up on GitHub. And that project will contain the code for these users and for everything else that you need. But essentially what I'm going to do is to copy two files from the template, one that contains the users and one that contains everything else. So these are the two files. There's one called testusers.cs that contains a set of test users. And notice, for example, we have a user with a name of Alice and a password of Alice. And then there's a file called config.cs. And this contains a set of resources that we want to protect. I've changed some of the data in here. For example, in this file, in the template, we have scopes called scope one and scope two. 
and I've changed those scopes to weather API.read and weather API.write. So later on in this video, we'll be using a weather service, and it makes sense to call the scopes that we're using for that weather service something like weather API.read and weather API.write. So the scope names in and of themselves aren't important as long as they mean something to you and to your application. So the resource is something that we're trying to protect. So here we have an API resource that's called weather API that has two scopes associated with it, weather API.read and weather API.write. So obviously this means there's something that can read from the weather API and something that can update the weather API, add, update, or delete items using this API. And we also have some identity resources as well. And these are things associated with a given identity. So the first two identity resources here, OpenID and Profile, represent some standard OpenID Connect scopes that we want Identity Server to support. And the OpenID scope, for example, is always required if we're using OpenID. Okay, so now that we have these values defined, we need to plug them into Identity Server. So back in program.cs, here, where I'm currently passing in a set of test users, instead, I can use the static list from my test users class and say test users dot users. And the same for the clients. The clients is in the config class. So I can say config dot clients and then replace all of these other things with similar data. So we can have config dot API resources, config dot API scopes and config dot identity resources. So if I restart the server and then refresh the discovery document, we now see that we have a whole set of scopes that are supported, including weather API.read and weather API.write. And also many claims supported now, such as subject and name and family name and so on and so forth. So now that identity server is configured, what can we do with it? So if I go back into the code here, you see in my config, I have some client setup and I have some resources and some scope setup. So how do we use this? So we have two clients here and we've called one of these M to M client, which just means machine to machine. And we've called the other interactive client. These are the client IDs. You should give your clients IDs that are meaningful to you. These are obviously just set up here for demo purposes. My M to M client is a client that's going to be used to protect an API. So to protect a REST service, if you like. And for this client, we've said we allow two scopes, whether API.read and whether API.write. And if I look up here, we'll see we have a couple of scopes defined, whether API.read and whether API.write. The client has a client secret associated with it. This secret is defined here. And again, this is any value you want to put into here, ideally some random value. This is a value that's known to the client and shouldn't be known to anybody else. But notice this value here is hashed. And it's that hashed value that's stored inside Identity Server. So the way this is going to work is that we'll have an endpoint. And users of that endpoint will be clients of the endpoint. Those clients need to get a token to allow them to access the endpoint. And the way we get the token is by asking Identity Server for that token. To get the token, we need to know three things. We need to know the client ID, we need to know the client's secret, and we need to know what scopes we want to ask for. If I look back at the discovery document, we'll see in here, there's an endpoint, which is this token endpoint. In our case, that's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash localhost 5443 slash connect slash token. So what we need to do is to send a request to that endpoint and that request will give us back a token. We can then use that token to connect to the server itself. And we pass that server the token. So in a moment, we'll see how we get that token in code. But what we can also do is just send an HTTP request to that endpoint to get the token. So we're going to use curl to send this request just to see what we get back. Now, as I've just said, a little later on, we'll write the service that this token will be used against. And we'll write a client that will need to get a token that it can pass to the service. And we'll write both of those in C sharp. But for now, just for demo purposes, just to see how this works, we're going to use curl to send a request to identity server to get back a token, just to see what that token looks like. So here we're going to send a post request. We're going to send a post request to our token endpoint, which is this localhost slash connect slash token. 
And notice in here, we're plugging in three values. We're plugging in the client ID, which is m to -M .client. We are plugging in the scope we want the token for. So we're just asking for the weather API dot read scope. And we plug in the client secret. So we need to know ahead of time what that secret is. And remember that secret is stored in identity server in hashed form. And I can run this command from my shell. So entering that curl command here, we get back some JSON. And that JSON contains a few things. It contains something called an access token. It tells us the token type, and this is something known as a bearer token. It tells us the scope the token is for, which is where the API dot read. And it also gives us some expiry information as well. So it has an expires in value. So I can grab the value of this token, which is this text here. And then we can parse this token and see what's inside it. Now, I'm not going to parse this by hand. Instead, I'm going to go to one of the websites that will do that for me. And there are a couple of these. I'm going to use something called jwt.ms. There's also jwt.io. JWT, that we pronounce as JOT, stands for JSON Web Token. So if I go to this site and paste in the token, this will decode the token for me. And notice the tokens in three parts. It has some metadata about the token. It has the information that the token itself contains, including things like the issuer and some dates. And it then also contains a signature that we can use to verify that the token is correct. If I go to the claims part of the token here, this is the set of information that comes from the token. So we can see the issuer claim, the not before claim, the issued act claim, and so on and so forth. I noticed in here as well, we have the scope. So this token is valid for the weather API.read scope. Okay, so now that we've seen how to get this token, we need to see how to use it. We want to see how to use this in both an MVC API application and an MVC web application. And we'll see how to do that in the next video.